uh, a talk by one of our own, Professor Min Wu from College Park, will talk today to us about exploiting micro signals for media and physiological forensics. Uh, as always, we ask that you mute yourself out during the talk and unmute yourself to ask questions as you see fit. Otherwise, Min, the whole audience is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers uh, for organizing this years of FFT colloquium series uh, um, that really bringing um, many of the speakers uh, and the colleagues uh, from all around the world um, to share a range of uh, topics, uh, um, both the theoretical foundations uh, in math and statistics, uh, as well as recent techniques and application areas, such as where I come from. So my expertise uh, is in between of uh, uh, signal image processing and the security and the forensics. I use various uh, data science uh, uh, pattern recognition techniques uh, in my work, which I will um, give you uh, a quick ride uh, through um, uh, some of these common things that will string many um, problems that I have worked on. And I will give you this ride uh, to uh, uh, invite you to think more that is, we are going to focus our attention to signals that has very small strength. In terms of a signal to noise ratio, uh, they are usually well below um, zero dB. Um, and in terms of uh, the strength, they can be up to an order of magnitude weaker than the dominant signals that we usually can see or hear, um, or in uh, small in terms of scale compared with those uh, uh, signals and data tackled by conventional algorithms. So I collectively call them as microsignals. So conventionally, our treatment of microsignal is to consider them as noise and the nuances. And in many applications, uh, we are either, either um, ignore them or try to remove them uh, through a denoising process. But in the field of information forensics, uh, uh, over the past two decades, uh, we have learned how to try to harness them by utilizing various modeling and uh, applied mathematical and engineering tools to help us uh, uh, utilizing microsignal to answer many forensic and security questions. So this slide showed you quite a few examples from my research groups actually spanning uh, a number of years. So some of the earlier examples I have also shared with uh, our Wena Center colleagues and the, in the previous uh, um, FFT years. Um, so for example, um, we can specifically design uh, microsignals and embed such special signals as tracers. And this builds on robust embedding uh, or digital watermarking, but with special properties uh, to uh, using those embedded tracer to uniquely label each copy of a document so that if someone leaked the information, we want to be able to trace uh, what kind of uh, um, embedded tracer microsignals are there uh, and uh, who was the source uh, of the leak. And we want this uh, because of these adversarial relations, we want this to be resilient against removal. So the example we show here, you can see my cursor, right? Um, uh, so the, the example you see here um, is uh, actually, uh, uh, we are uh, making very, very small changes uh, um, um, uh, of this uh, um, serving as a digital fingerprint or in some of the uh, community call them as a forensic watermark. And we apply them to geospatial data. So basically maps, so this is a topographical map uh, to describe the data about a terrain whether it's land or ocean floor, while preserving the data fidelity. And then each of the copy can have a different set of uh, um, 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 kind of different way of uh, small changes to signal different recipient identity. And this concept can be applied not only to map data, but many other video image, sound signal, or other signals that you would like to protect. So today, actually, almost all Hollywood films uh, uh, when they come out from the um, studio and for distribution, they have a such micro signal, they call them as forensic watermark, and this serving as a tracer embedded in. Uh, they would in discourage the unauthorized distributions, whether it's by the Oscar judging committees or individual um, uh, movie critics uh, or in the distributed to individual theaters to make sure they uh, well guard those and prevent from uh, illicit distribution. 
There are also other types of um, microsignals that may not be this kind of proactive, but are also more uh, opportunistic uh, or inherently captured during the imaging or sensing process. Um, so for example, how the color is sensed by an imaging process and how, what are the noise statistics. And what I'm showing you is uh, uh, the illustration that we try to utilize the uh, Bayer pattern uh, that induces specific uh, correlations uh, between different color channels uh, at different uh, uh, pixel levels. Uh, and also um, here um, is if you have a smoothened uh, an image, we actually can uh, model this process and to derive uh, and visualize the uh, microsignals in the form of uh, um, such pattern. It's actually the, the frequency nows of, of those uh, uh, smoothing. So uh, this uh, line of uh, uh, microsignals will help us provide evidence about the origin and integrity of the images. So basically where they come from, what changes have been made on it. Uh, if you consider that there is a growing concerns of fake news and fake media, this type of uh, uh, microsignals are becoming increasingly important uh, to tell us about the integrity um, of our media. And another class of microsignals are associated with the physical objects, so that's the third one here, uh, physical objects or physical surfaces. Uh, for example, every piece of uh, uh, a paper every patch of a paper, even coming from the same uh, piles, uh, uh, on the microscopic levels, uh, um, the surface structures is unique and very, very difficult to perfectly reproduce. Uh, this means that they serve as a form of a physically unclonable feature or a nickname of PUF. Uh, so if we know how to image them and how to represent and archive them, they can actually serve as a unique fingerprint, physical fingerprint to help us discover whether there's any counterfeit uh, or whether there's any uh, duplications. Um, you can think of uh, having this technology uh, to um, um, image uh, the labels of uh, luxury wine uh, or the packaging of medicine to prevent uh, um, the, the counterfeit um, or duplications. Um, now, what I want to share with you today uh, are actually the two type of uh, microsignals on the right-hand side. Um, they are coming from and uh, uh, representing uh, uh, some um, properties of the surrounding environment on the top and also to track uh, vital signs. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, the environmental microsignals. Um, and actually, we motivated uh, the environmental microsignals uh, when we try to answer the forensic question, when you have a piece of a recording, when and where they were captured. Uh, my favorite example to motivate why these are important questions are uh, just to think about the propaganda video of Bin Laden. Um, during his lifetime, uh, whenever he broadcast a propaganda video, many people fighting terrorists around the world want to know uh, when the video was shot and where the video was shot. And there's also a visual track, there's sound track. Are they captured at the same time, which means a certain intelligence information? Or are they captured uh, um, uh, later on, I mean, separately, and then superimposed later on? Uh, so these are actually very, very hard questions from a traditional security uh, uh, measure point of view. You really cannot use uh, crypto to tackle it. You can use network security because this is a much open uh, world and also out, out of the digital uh, closed system. It's uh, in, the, in the analog domains. Um, so, but if we uh, think about uh, audio visual recording as a form of sensing, so that's where uh, my background as an ECE, as an engineer coming in, that if you think about the sensors, they can be affected by the surrounding environment they are in. Um, and uh, if we know uh, what are the signatures uh, are there and uh, uh, what kind of traces uh, uh, they got into our sensor recording and the harness, then we have the potential to address those time and location questions. And one of the nearly ubiquitous influence is actually from our power network. And this is where uh, you see uh, a trace that we actually can derive from a, a visual recording and they actually represent the power property. Uh, so let me uh, tell you some more about this, uh, 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 this environmental uh, microsignals. Uh, so uh, from an uh, uh, engineering point of view, we know that the, the current and, uh, and the power uh, of our grid, of uh, the modern grid, 
follow sinusoid. Um, and um, uh, what you see from this uh, center of the, uh, the spectrogram, this actually visualizing the instantaneous uh, frequency of the power. And actually, um, we know there's a nominal frequency, so how many cycles per, per second. Uh, in North America, um, it's, a 50, uh, it's a 60 uh, hertz, so 60 cycles per second. But in most of other parts of the world, Asia, Europe, uh, um, the nominal is a 50 hertz. Um, but if you tap into the power outlet, we can do a DIY circuit. I'm going to show you in, uh, in the next slide. Um, you are going to see that this, uh, uh, the, the frequency is never exactly 50 or 60 hertz. The dynamic process of our ever-changing demand for electricity and also the power generation and the control mechanisms in the grid to meet our demand results in trying to stabilize uh, uh, this uh, uh, power frequency um, as much as possible. But at an instantaneous time, at any given time, there is a, these variations. And this is actually known as electric network frequency, or ENF in short. And what you see is a variation. So horizontal is frequency, uh, vertical is time. Um, and this uh, can be recorded uh, from a DIY circuit, as I, uh, I mentioned. They also have uh, uh, very interesting properties. The major trends of these ENF variations uh, are consistent in the same interconnected grid. So in US, this means that uh, we have a big uh, um, Eastern grid. Uh, we actually can use our uh, circuit to record that. Uh, and you actually, for this frequency um, attribute, you don't even need a uh, collaboration from from power company. You can do it as a DIY circuit. And we would then be able to know what are the major trends at this given time uh, um, from New York City, Florida, Atlanta, uh, Chicago, actually also Toronto, and so on, because uh, we are connected with uh, the Eastern Canada uh, Canadian grid as well, uh, because we share the major trends of this variation. But at any given time, we are different uh, um, from San Francisco, um, LA, Seattle, uh, Vancouver. They are in the Western grid. And Texas is always special. They have their own grid. Um, so this actually uh, would be um, interesting that uh, from one location, I actually would be able to know um, other grid locations measure um, ENF variation um, over time. And another interesting thing is uh, uh, the ENF can be found uh, from sensor recording. So I, I call them and they can be seen and heard um, from by different mechanisms. Um, e either by um, electrical interference, if we have the sensor connected to the power outlet, uh, or by EM interference, uh, such as um, um, some type of some microphones or electronic uh, um, uh, devices, they can be influenced by the EM interference, or they capture the variations uh, uh, in terms of vibrations or hummings uh, from the equipment uh, uh, surrounding us uh, that are hooked to the power, or they could be influenced by lighting. And think about the, um, the light illuminated the scene. Uh, there could be subtle differences in the brightness from what we captured in the camera uh, that's reflecting the, uh, that's representing the changes from the lighting. And the light connected with the power. So this is actually nearly invisible, but if we uh, look at average brightness frame by frame, we could visualize those and those actually form a sinusoid. Uh, and, and you actually could see that um, the, uh, because of the uh, brightness is a, a form of a, a energy that we uh, reviewed, uh, it's uh, independent of the polarity of the, um, of the voltage or current applied. So the actual variations uh, if follow the power law is doubled of that. So it's actually a, a, a hundred Hertz or 120 Hertz nominal, depending on which grid you are in. But in either case uh, we have, uh, we can analyze those uh, um, um, variations uh, from our sensor recording. Um, if they are captured at the same time, they will be subject to the same variation compared with the power reference that we are collecting. Uh, so we can, when we align um, at the uh, right time instance with our reference uh, and uh, uh, between the, uh, the EMF extract from the sensor and the reference, uh, and also coming from the right grid, uh, it's all coming from the Eastern grid, for example, or all from, let's say, uh, India grid, uh, then we are expecting to see uh, the, the wiggle in the same way. 
Um, and this uh, will enable us to use a similarity comparison, for example, do a normalized uh, uh, correlation studies to be able to see a peak. And uh, th that is an indication, uh, a way to verify uh, what are the uh, recorded grid and what are the recording time. And if we don't know what's the time, uh, we can compare with uh, the power references and do this alignment to identify uh, what is the likely um, 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 sensing time uh, and the grid location. So that is the basic idea uh, how we can verify the time and the grid location. Uh, so as I promised, uh, this is actually a, a DIY circuit we have uh, with uh, a transformer reducing the uh, the power outlet uh, voltage to a safety range, and then with the uh, voltage divider and passing into the uh, the analog digital um, digitization process and to to record and analyze. And before I actually um, uh, analyzing any of the media recordings, uh, um, and we have uh, been inspired by uh, forensic scientists' work, uh, especially by Kathleen Gregus. Uh, uh, who was a Romanian um, scientist that has uh, first uh, um, uh, worked on this for the sound recording uh, when he was asked by judge to determine and verify the, the time for some of the uh, recordings going to the court system. And I consider myself uh, uh, playing with various forms of signals, but more uh, with visual data. So I was really intrigued and I want to see, can we actually get this uh, ENF from the um, visual recording, from the sound, um, optical recording. Uh, so before we analyze the camera, we did this uh, proof of concept uh, um, experiment with a, a highly sensitive, a high bandwidth photo diodes, and we actually can see uh, this sinusoidal waveform in very, very clean um, single tonality ratios. And that gives us uh, uh, some baseline confidence. And then we are looking at uh, um, visual recordings uh, from cameras. They are actually very challenging. Uh, not only that uh, uh, the, the signals is really, really small that our, our eyes cannot uh, usually uh, see them, but they also have a very limited sampling rate. So uh, the common video camera uh, um, is about, to, uh, the frame rate is about 25 to 30 frames per second. Uh, with the analog counterpart and the, the root, we are commonly see um, uh, the digital video uh, cameras uh, following uh, a frame rate uh, just below uh, 30 frames per second. Now, um, I, if we recall, um, if we are going to capture, let's say, a 50 hertz uh, uh, grid, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is independent of the polarity, so the nominal of the brightness change frame by frame is 100 hertz, um, and in other grid, it will be 120 hertz, but we only have uh, less than 30 uh, hertz of the sampling rate. So that is, uh, we, we know that we have aliasing and that aliasing uh, can be uh, analyzed. So we are fortunate that uh, for both cost and design issues, uh, the, uh, the optical sensors rarely have uh, these anti-aliasing filters uh, uh, in this, uh, 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 in this uh, uh, spatial uh, temporal domain of the sampling. So we actually um, benefit from that, that we are seeing that the, the first, uh, the base uh, um, uh, fre frequency of uh, uh, plus and minus uh, 100 hertz in the uh, Fourier spectrum will be alias to just above 10 hertz. And then the harmonics uh, will be um, alias to um, just below the 10 hertz, and they're also uh, a small copy just above the DC. Uh, so that's actually where we should uh, look for if we are considering our video camera have this global shutter that are capturing uh, about 30 uh, times per, uh, per second. So if you look closer, uh, this was actually just uh, repeating the, uh, the spectrum I showed you. This was uh, the 10 hertz that actually matching with our, um, our aliasing analysis. Uh, and also because it's a power law, you can see the wiggling uh, amount is about twice of the, um, the, the base, uh, uh, the power frequencies. Uh, but we can use a similarity uh, check to verify whether they come from the same um, grid. And if we go back to the Bin Laden question, uh, that there is a visual track, there is sound track, are they captured at the same time? Uh, and if they, they were, uh, they should be subject to the same power uh, uh, frequency variation. So, and that's indeed the case. Uh, this was uh, a recording we made in India. Um, they are 50 hertz nominal, and you can see those are the audio track, and those are the visual track. And they actually, we can, what we say is we can forensically bind them 
to show they are captured at the same time. And this concept actually can be applied uh, to other multiple media streams, uh, whether it's visual or audio or multiple video. Uh, you can imagine that you and the friends are attending a sports game or an important uh, ceremony. Uh, you don't actually need a protocol or dedicated devices. You could use your camera and uh, um, you um, capture at different locations. And then afterward, we could exploit the traces of ENF to synchronize a multiple stream and provide a multi-view rendition. And uh, along the line, we uh, can also answer interpreted questions. If uh, um, temporally we inserted a clip or we removed the clip, the ENF is varying relatively slowly um, um, in, uh, uh, over time, um, and you will expect to have some form of continuities. Uh, with the exception, there is a major, major power outage. Um, the, the frequency may have uh, more abrupt transitions. But without those uh, um, catastrophic events, we usually will see more contiguous. So when you see this, there is a jump here, and then also jumping back, there is a strong uh, suspicion, and this is a strong evidence, that there is uh, uh, some integrity um, uh, issues with, uh, with this uh, video clip. And if you further have the power reference, we actually can analyze segment by segment to, um, to, in, to tell you what are the likely um, uh, capturing time of each of the segment. And with this, uh, with the abrupt changes, we can also tell where uh, uh, and from when um, this uh, video was, uh, the, the inserted clip was likely coming from. Um, so further uh, to talk about uh, the location. So far, the location issues uh, uh, that we can address is by um, similarity checks. So basically, exotic search uh, with uh, our power references, uh, exotic searching with all the possible grid you are uh, uh, considering uh, as the possibilities, uh, as well as all the possible time. And this is actually not, not only a tedious process computationally, it also are prone to uh, force alarm. So when you have to make uh, so many comparisons uh, with uh, so many candidates, uh, sooner or later, you may make a, a, a false alarm and, a, a mistake. Uh, and also, not always we may have uh, these concurrent power recordings to uh, let us uh, do this uh, um, inference. Uh, and what we are looking at is when there is no concurrent power recording, what can we do? When we visualize the, the data we collected from uh, multiple places around the world. Usually, this was leveraging our um, personal or, or, or conference uh, trips uh, to different uh, uh, worldwide locations. You actually can see this is our uh, Eastern US grid um, um, by the uh, advanced uh, grid uh, control mechanism and abundant uh, power uh, resources uh, to match uh, the demand. We are actually very, very stable. Uh, but when you zoom in, you can actually see. Uh, these uh, wiggling patterns uh, on the level of uh, about um, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 hertz levels. And India is a big grid, but their uh, algorithms are, and controls are not as advanced as us. You see frequent uh, big swings. Uh, in China, actually, also, they, they have actually in between of India and, and, uh, um, and the US and have more of the harmonics we observed. And Lebanon uh, in an area with a lot of uh, political uh, instabilities uh, and also very limited power resources, power outage are common there. So my student who worked on this project captured the data when uh, visiting his family. You can see there's a frequent wiggle and there's also bigger swings and quite uh, uh, frequently observed. Actually, by eyeballing them, we already um, have the intuition that we can analyze the um, the um, features describing the pattern of a variation, and then we can casting it uh, under a pattern classification or machine learning framework uh, to infer uh, when, uh, where will, will be the uh, likely grid that have generated uh, a piece of recording carrying the ENF we extract. So we did that, um, that this was actually before the, uh, the major advancement of uh, deep learning uh, a few years back, and also we have a limited uh, uh, data, so basically smaller data problem, uh, we use uh, uh, features that uh, coming from our 
um, our modeling and uh, both statistical and physical understandings of the problem. So we use, uh, I mean, mean and the variance are, of course, uh, uh, the first things to uh, consider. Uh, you can almost immediately differentiate 50 versus the 60 hertz uh, grid. Um, and in addition, we have seen um, the benefit from using wave data analysis to look at the time frequency features at a different uh, uh, time frequency scales. Uh, and also an AR modeling to uh, help us uh, looking at uh, how this uh, autoregressive properties as well as uh, um, in terms of the residue. Uh, and you can see, I mean, they visualize the different features uh, for you three at a time. You can see we can actually differentiate uh, different grid, uh, both in terms of the same um, 60 hertz grid, US East and West and Quebec, uh, as well as the multiple 50 hertz grid uh, around the world. Um, and certainly with more data, we can um, also leverage uh, some of the deep learning tools um, as well. And we are actually uh, making uh, new uh, uh, progress and have a new result along that line. We also um, have actually um, um, uh, bring this uh, after our initial research, shape this into a student project uh, where we um, um, have uh, got uh, um, IEEE, um, Single Processing Society, to adopt it uh, as a, a, a global undergraduate competition. Um, and um, um, we have also written an article and make the data available for the community. Uh, now, uh, uh, for the ENF signals uh, here, uh, we also have the um, uh, po possibilities uh, to analyze many of the historical data, uh, especially many of the historical uh, sound recordings were captured uh, using um, uh, electromagnetic tapes. The uh, potential uh, ENF uh, uh, traces could be even more profound. So we have done a series of work along that line in collaboration with our iSchool colleagues. And this is really using the modern tools to help with the digital, um, uh, digital humanity. Um, and one of the uh, examples I showed here was actually uh, leveraging the knowledge now uh, with this ENF uh, uh, recording when we have tapes uh, that have a serious um, um, uh, distortions uh, during the uh, capturing. Uh, you will see uh, artifacts. Let me see if I, uh, I don't think I shared audio. So let me reshare mine and so that I can play with you. Um, okay, share sound. Okay, so from here. This is Apollo Control at 57 hours, 44 uh, minutes. Can everyone hear it? We've had no further reports yes. uh, from the crew to indicate whether or not uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin have returned to the command module. This is a, a historically very important piece uh, of the audio clip. So that's when uh, Neil Armstrong uh, just finished uh, the moon landing mission and returning to uh, to the lunar modules. Uh, um, and the, um, the, the Houston, um, the, the ground base, uh, has the trouble in getting connecting with them. And you actually already heard that the, uh, the announcers actually had this uh, very, very low distorted voice. Um, and traditionally, we would need to know who was speaking or do a trial and error to modeling their pitch and restore this piece of recording. But now we know that there is potential, this ENF traces there. So indeed, we analyze it and we see very, very clear um, um, ENF traces. And we actually can use them as a natural inherent uh, pilot signals. And you see um, why they, uh, this is uh, they distorted. They were supposed to be around 60 Hertz. Our Eastern grid is very flat, very, very stable um, uh, on the, this uh, overall level, but the actually um, the, the, the playback and the recording speed doesn't really match. So we can use our nominal understandings and then to guide how much uh, restoration of the speed that we can do. And here is actually a very uh, simple uh, restoration just by that trace without any of the uh, speech modeling. This is Apollo Control at 57 hours, 44 minutes. We've had no further reports uh, from the crew to indicate whether or not uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin have returned to the command module. Okay, so that's the basic idea um, of uh, utilizing this uh, to our advantages, and there are also many other uses for from preservation to restoration to time location inference. Um, and I, uh, when we talk about uh, how we extract the ENF, I actually been 
uh, very brief, uh, and I talk about uh, the global shutter effect. Uh, but the, um, since our initial work, actually, steam auto sensors has becoming much more popular and uh, um, in many of the uh, today's uh, camera. The steam auto sensors actually capture sceneries are in quite a different ways. So, um, they are known to have these rolling shutters. So the, the data is captured line by line. Uh, and they are actually notorious uh, to have uh, artifacts that need to be uh, restored um, because so when you have a fast moving cars, uh, by the time you capture the lower part, the car already moved to the new uh, location. Uh, from the in-app extraction point of view, we have a both challenge and uh, an opportunity. The challenge is uh, if it's a line by line capture, I actually need to know what are the, the signals coming from the scenery and what are actually coming as a result of these very subtle small changes of ENF at that time. Uh, but we have the opportunity uh, to resolve the, um, the limited sampling rate problem because we have the potential to see the ENF snapshot at each of the line capturing time instance. With the reasonable resolutions uh, of hundreds of lines so easily, uh, we can actually address uh, the, the aliasing problem. So that is what we were set out doing. Um, and also considering our, our video can have a potential uh, movement, both the global uh, camera uh, panning as well as the object movement. So this is what we did. We tried to um, segment uh, what are the, 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 the signal we see from each of the line in terms of the average color, how much they come from the content, uh, how much they come from the, these very small uh, changes of the ENF. By the content, if there's no movement, uh, we were looking at this, uh, uh, utilizing the temporal redundancies, looking at the different frames of the same line. If there are movement, we were going to use the uh, first uh, um, motion analysis uh, and the compensation to estimate where they should be uh, and what other part is actually, um, um, the, the, I mean, the, the, where the object going and we try to compensate the movement. And then uh, looking at the motion compensation residue, uh, that will be the part that uh, containing more of the other noise, including ENF. And then we will string those uh, um, uh, after compensations, uh, looking at the residual between this analysis and then collecting those uh, data uh, representing each of the rows uh, as a, a potential ENF containing uh, um, signal. And that is where we are going to do the frequency analysis to derive the EMF uh, information. Um, what you are seeing here are, are the two videos that captured by um, CMOS video camera. And then we can capture and estimate the uh, EMF from the visual recording. And then we can align, uh, uh, the, uh, align them temporally. Um, so in traditional way, if you only rely on the visual track, uh, to do this uh, uh, alignment and the stitching together, you will need to have uh, uh, overlap uh, uh, content. I need to have the camera capturing exactly the same person. But in this uh, example, uh, my student uh, Hui Su, who worked on this, he actually was out of the view uh, for quite some time. You don't have a significant overlapping content. But by utilizing ENF, uh, we are able to synchronize this to uh, one camera uh, was the uh, turn off uh, was the turn on um, about a minute uh, earlier than the other one. Um, so if we summarize what we learned from the micro signal, uh, we have this residual analysis uh, where uh, we, we know that the dominant signal can disguise uh, the, the micro signal, whether it's coming from the overlighting, the motion, the content. Um, so what we did was if we directly do uh, um, a temper analyzing um, um, these uh, microsignal, the signal to noise ratio, as far as the uh, microsignal of interest, is way, way too low. Uh, so, what we did is uh, we uh, try to do the uh, easier job first. We try to analyze uh, what are the dominant signals and then looking at uh, what are the residue. So, we compensate that the residue uh, will have uh, the microsignals, uh, uh, the uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, would be uh, improved. And this uh, residual analysis uh, shared the spirit uh, of the, um, the trending process from statistics. Except here, the detrending is not just a simple uh, um, linear fittings uh, or simple model, but actually need to draw domain knowledge uh, and the synergies, uh, for example, from uh, video image uh, processing or computer vision uh, to really analyze motions and, uh, and, other, um, 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 uh, and other traits. 
And if we uh, have a, uh, some statistical uh, knowledges, we can also um, use, for example, um, uh, the uh, schedule source separations, such as independent component analysis, to help us uh, uh, separate those uh, different signal sources out. Um, the physical models uh, and the properties, such as in the power cases, it is a sinusoid waveforms with thoroughly changing frequency can also be very helpful. And this is actually one of the angles that uh, uh, we see in the opportunities uh, um, for us to, um, uh, to really transfer uh, the understanding and techniques to other part of uh, uh, microsignal analysis, for example, the emerging physiological forensics, uh, where we are looking for uh, ways uh, without using any contact and touch sensors to monitor our physiological condition. And uh, one of the physical conditions uh, that's uh, really important is uh, our heart rate uh, as a very important uh, vital sign. Traditional way, we have to wear some sensors uh, or we have to really touch on holding on the, uh, the uh, treadmill uh, uh, handles uh, in order to get our heart rate sensed. Uh, but in the recent decade, we have actually seen uh, promising uh, research uh, to explore uh, using video without any touch uh, to, to analyze the video and infer the vital signs. As our heart pump blood to everywhere of our body, um, the periodical blood flow changes uh, uh, underneath of the, our skin can actually be revealed as a very subtle uh, color changes at the same pace. So by uh, the um, pioneering work from um, uh, Vacuum um, in 2008, uh, as well as some of the uh, additional work uh, uh, soon after by two groups of MIT, especially from this uh, uh, very popular demo from the MIT groups uh, uh, that you see here, if uh, we don't have any movement, just stationary, we have the potential to analyze frame by frame what are the average uh, uh, facial color, and then we can amplify it and we can analyze in terms of the frequency uh, component to track the heart rate. So when we uh, look at this line of problem, again, we are intrigued by, um, but uh, we also ask uh, what are the challenging situations? What if the person is not sitting still there? What if you are running on the treadmill uh, and you don't want to, like a professional athlete, to wear this uh, uncomfortable uh, chest strap? Uh, or your wearables becoming uh, popular, but there's a usually loose fitting. It's a quite noisy, not always reliable. And in the um, application scenarios where uh, we may have, uh, um, like say, a driver monitoring in this bumpy car, uh, and also those uh, children with special needs, we want to monitor their physiologic, uh, uh, physical conditions to uh, do some early warnings of a potential breakdown or in the uh, law enforcement the surveillance. So in all those, uh, we want to see how we can tackle this uh, dominant movement uh, that's going to be um, really disguise uh, uh, our microsignal. So here, uh, what I want to uh, let you know is what we've seen is actually a form, uh, not new, it's known as the photo prismogram using the optical ways to measure the blood volume change. Um, and with uh, COVID, we are all familiar with uh, the, uh, the oximeter's role to capture uh, and measure the blood oxygen level, as well as the, um, the heart rate through the uh, periodic blood, uh, uh, blood flow, uh, blood volume changes um, in uh, our fingers or, or the ear lobe. So that there we have a light source, and then we see on the other side what is the absorption by having the, uh, the photosensors. And what we are seeing here um, in terms of a camera is actually measuring basically the same mechanism, but with uh, this remote or contact free. So this is known as the RPPG, PPG standing for photo optical sensing of pre seam organ, uh, the, the volume changes uh, using instrument to measure them. So here we have a light source, uh, and then it's penetrated uh, different layers of our skin and then reflected back and captured by sensors. And you can see we can be influenced by the pigment. So different skin color uh, may um, um, have a different uh, levels of uh, challenges. Um, and uh, as our blood volume changes and we see those reflected lights and we can analyze the color. So that is a basic imaging mechanism. And then going back to how we uh, tackle the, the motion issues. So our residual analysis can be applied here. Uh, my student Chang Zhu, who worked on this project, uh, 
uh, we see him um, actually uh, uh, running on the uh, the elliptic machine. Uh, so we uh, take the video and use uh, our um, um, high resolution motion analysis to uh, recognize and align them, stabilize that uh, video and identify the region of interest. Uh, this can also be extended to the whole um, facial color range if we have a, a, a facial um, a region detector. Uh, and then uh, we will be looking at those uh, facial colors uh, frame by frame. Um, and then we try to merging those color information into a signal that contain mostly uh, re relevant to the heart rate. Uh, and this signal can still be quite noisy uh, and we need to tackle that uh, very faint noisy um, frequency analysis problems. And we visualize uh, the, uh, the cleanup versions for you. Um, and here is our, our, uh, our estimated heart rate. And this uh, is our uh, overlaid results. The black ones are coming from the uh, gold standard using the chest strap that uh, um, Chiang is wearing. And the red ones were from our estimate using only the video. And this was actually a version that uh, we were able to track uh, in nearly real time. And you can see mostly we are well within 1% of the, um, um, the relative error. Actually, the, the wearables, uh, 3 to 5% of deviations uh, is very common. Um, so you can see this as a promising way to uh, have a contact-free physiological monitoring. We actually do not even need uh, uh, the, the persons to be aware of uh, we are capturing and we are doing this analysis. Um, so here we summarize a few steps uh, uh, of what I just described. And what we see again technically, uh, in addition to this residual analysis that I described, there are also one of the common uh, challenges and needs that we see from this uh, physio um, microsignal as well as uh, in other microsignal problems uh, uh, such as the ENF, the power signature and others. That is how we are, can track very noisy, very faint traces. Um, and I initially I thought this tracking this uh, uh, frequency uh, and time uh, var varying uh, instantaneous frequency is a really a uh, uh, a simple problem because uh, it's really uh, frequency analysis uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, a bread and butter of uh, signal processing. But actually, uh, despite we have uh, many of the uh, techniques uh, in the classical literature, uh, the problem here is actually very challenging because many of the conventional techniques doesn't really work be well below zero dB. Um, this is uh, what we see. Um, you see this uh, dominant traces from the motion. Um, and, and that's uh, if we do not do any, uh, we, we can't even see the heart rate. Uh, if we do this uh, residual analysis, we start be able to see the heart rate, but we may still have uh, some residual motions that are quite uh, strong. And you see that faint one. And this one is actually from the, uh, the power signature. So with uh, different uh, surrounding acoustic environment with different movement, different equipment, uh, time varying uh, changes. Uh, uh, when we do uh, audio uh, recordings and analyze the ENF, at times they can be faint, uh, fading out uh, that you can barely see by naked eye. And this, all these are very challenging for the traditional, whether it's a piano gland, whether it's a substance music uh, 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 algorithms or, or, or aspirator algorithms and, and the others. That's a very challenging to, um, to extract uh, reliably. Another example uh, coming from and the courtesy of uh, uh, the work from my colleague Ray Liu and his collaborator Feng Zhang um, in their commercialization effort of the RF uh, um, uh, analytics and sensing. Um, so this is they are using the Wi-Fi based uh, um, RF signals um, to um, sense the breathing. So as we breathe, uh, if there's no major changes in the surrounding, um, we actually perturb the ambient radio uh, frequency uh, radio signal profiles and has very, very faint perturbations of what the, the receive the RF signals. And with their effort, uh, they can actually analyze and uh, harness that. And you can see it's a boil down to uh, want to track a very, very faint uh, signal. So with all these different uh, um, area of uh, microsignal analysis, we see this, this common need. Um, so since we have found that um, the, the conventional approaches doesn't work well because of very low synchronous ratio. 
very strong interference from other sources. Uh, and also, in many cases, this is not a big data problem. The distortions are there, we know, uh, but they are highly time varying and have uh, many occasions of unforeseen situations. Uh, that means that even though, for example, pitch tracking in speech uh, analysis is uh, uh, one of the kind of uh, widely studied uh, problems, we do not have uh, the luxury as uh, speech colleagues to have abundant data and have uh, more regularities of what are the signal they are looking for, what type of distortions they, they, are, they are commonly tackling. So what we see is a need uh, if we can have a, a more general and universal method to help us do this, uh, at least the initial tracking analysis, and then we will be able to uh, bootstrapping to do more refinement. So that is what we see how we can do. And what we were inspired, again, going back to our visual route, uh, was inspired by um, works from image processing and computer vision, uh, especially a, a form of um, uh, work known as a scene carving. This uh, is the idea how we can reshape the uh, size of the picture uh, to fit a different aspect ratio, but preserving the salient objects. So here, um, the, the idea was uh, they were defining an energy function to track what are the scenes that has a uh, low uh, energy, so very um, low scene complexity, and we can remove or carving them, but preserving those salient important content and into this one. And there's a similar uh, methodologies uh, or spirit was also in the various uh, contour trackings, such as the active contours, the snake work, also defining the energy functions and then to optimize and track. So we were inspired by that. Uh, we define an energy functions that has uh, two major parts, one coming from the spectral one that we respect what are the spectral energy that we, um, we are observing here. And then we have, uh, a regularization time turns to trace what are the Markovian dynamics. So we want to be able to maintain a good um, uh, uh, reasonably kind of uh, continuities avoid, avoid uh, jumps, uh, but with a really very um, limited, a very small amount of uh, assumptions uh, made uh, uh, to the uh, algorithm. So it basically it's almost like a model free. We don't really spend a lot of time or have the luxury of the data to help uh, uh, to model those statistics. So you can see uh, from this demo at uh, minus 10 dB, we actually can track those uh, very faint traces uh, very well. Um, and that also can apply to uh, the heart rate to tra tracking here. Uh, and we compare with uh, um, kind of more periodogram or more advanced periodogram approaches, as well as uh, um, some of the approaches uh, um, of uh, um, um, of uh, uh, particle filter, for example, the, the the blue lines was from the particle filter approach. The uh, the uh, uh, this uh, actually this is a uh, almost uh, overlapping um, where um, the uh, our tracking of that uh, uh, red line that I couldn't uh, see very well. Um, that's actually from our algorithm, and then the it's uh, really conform very well with this uh, uh, white dotted line that was uh, coming from the other uh, reference signals. So we have some more details uh, discussing, depending on what signals uh, uh, in the horizon we have, when we have the entire session, we can do a more offline uh, um, uh, tracking so to do this uh, dynamic programming. If we have only limited horizons, uh, we were looking at how we can um, handle the, um, uh, the corresponding situations uh, to do nearly uh, near uh, real-time tracking. So this uh, paper uh, was published in the transaction, actually transaction on um, information forensic and uh, security. Um, so uh, to the, the last uh, piece I want to um, really share with you uh, is related to here. It's actually also pushing the, the envelope. Um, when we have this heart rate tracking, uh, I had a very interesting discussion with uh, uh, a program manager at uh, NIH, and he posed this intriguing challenge. He said that, Heart rate is important to fitness and sports, uh, but for medical doctors, ECG is the gold standard. Can I analyze video and track ECG? So this is a really challenging and actually haven't been done uh, by our best knowledge because actually just for the heart rate, it's already very, very weak. And we have really uh, have to do all this heavy lifting to just track the heart rate well. 
Uh, but I was really intrigued uh, and stimulated by the challenge. And I formulated these intermediate questions uh, as an enabler. Uh, that is, uh, uh, could I relate, what are the relation between the ECG and the PPG? Um, and the, the, the reason is uh, the PPG, the, this uh, video capturing is a form of a remote PPG. It's noisy, but if we know how to denoise, which uh, uh, in our applied math and the signal processing, we are quite good at in finding various ways to do. Um, and uh, even the fingertip ones is a slightly cleaner version of, uh, uh, of the PPG. Um, so if I can relate PPG and ECG, then I can divide and conquer to tackle the denoising problem and then relate the denoised PPG we see um, in, uh, with, uh, 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 with ECG. But even for this, uh, uh, if you talk with a cardiologist uh, uh, or bioengineering, uh, they would tell you, well, they are very, very different sensing modality. Uh, and uh, even though they see uh, the, there is a potential uh, advantage and the benefit that we actually can allow um, continuous monitoring of ECG, you don't have to uh, deal with that annoying stickers. We can actually transfer the much abundant uh, cardio uh, um, uh, clinical knowledge uh, in cardio-based analysis from ECG, transfer it to this more new uh, modality of PPG. So this is actually what we have seen, um, that the ECG has this signature waveform, and the PPG is much smoother. So I overlay one of the cycle for you. Uh, as an engineer and in the signal processing, we actually can, uh, when seeing this, so my intuition is, they are like a filter uh, because the ECG is close to the source, that's the electric potential. And after the, it trickles our muscles uh, contraction and relaxations, then it's our blood serving as this fluid median uh, passing through our different uh, uh, part of our body. And then those blood volume changes got optically sensed, whether it's the optimeter or by video. Uh, so with this uh, process, it's like a filter in this engineering process, even though the, uh, their modality, their, their sensing mechanisms are different. Uh, so you can see that if I have the potential to analyze this uh, filter, I could inverse uh, this uh, influence, uh, the inverse problem. But in this inverse problem, uh, you can see that PPG is a more low path nature. Uh, we know in the um, inverse filtering, we actually can um, do the inverse filtering to try to restore the lower frequency part. It is the higher frequency part that got lost that we cannot directly infer. But we also know, in addition, ECG is not any arbitrary waveform. They have this signature QRS complex waveform. So that means that different parts of the spectrum are actually correlated. If we know how to draw their correlations, how they are related, we have the potential to use the lower spectrum to actually infer the higher spectrum. In speech area, when we have a limited phone quality uh, signals, there are work of uh, a bandwidth extension to actually recover high quality ones. And by similar uh, uh, mechanisms and similar uh, methodologies of utilizing the unique uh, speech signals structure. So we actually, by this thinking, instead of doing these two steps, we actually can do one step, we use this and we try to draw what are the relations that we can infer both the lower spectrum and the higher spectrum. So that is uh, what we are really working on uh, as a model and the data supported learning. Um, this is actually summarized uh, briefly in the block diagram here. After pre-processing, uh, we can um, analyze how we represent the ECG signals, how we represent the PPG signals and how they are related. And after we can learn from this relation, both by this model, this uh, kind of physical and math, mathematical uh, driven model, as well as using data to learn those mappings, uh, we can then uh, use a trained model to take the PPG from the, uh, the users um, and then um, to, um, uh, to use this mapping to infer what would be the ECG. So that is the basic idea. Uh, and we started with uh, uh, the representation using the well understood uh, DCT basis uh, and give us a baseline. And you can see we print using a principled approach instead of throwing everything into a neural network and then um, not explainable at all. 
Um, and then after the initial success of DCP, we also recognize that there's some complex waveforms that we need a richer representation. So we use a dictionary learning to enhance uh, um, our representation capability. And we actually jointly learn how we can use those uh, dictionary to represent ECG and PPG, and then learn their relations uh, uh, cycle by cycle. Uh, and you can see we actually can um, really recover the ECG waveform very well, even when the PPG domain, the source waveform for different patients with different conditions actually are quite similar, uh, but their ECG are very different and we were able to, to learn and recover those. Uh, and with some more abundant data, such as from the MIT uh, ICU data, the MIMIC uh, uh, database, uh, we are uh, in the process actually to incorporate deeper models on certain modules to provide a richer representation. Uh, so that is uh, uh, kind of a, what uh, uh, I want to give you this ride um, of uh, uh, the uh, expanding the forensic scopes uh, in um, microsignals. Uh, we harness them uh, from law enforcement to journalism to physio and health monitoring. We see the cross uh, synergies uh, among multiple technical areas. They are shared problems that we have tackled from our background. I really um, uh, look forward to interactions uh, with uh, our applied math and the statistical colleagues uh, and the other um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, working on imaging uh, to see if we have uh, even more broader and more general tools to tackle those uh, challenges. There are both the benefits and the cautions I mentioned briefly about privacy issues that uh, you can sense of someone's heart without even letting them know. But again, we see the promising use of them in telehealth, especially with the uh, uh, with the COVID, uh, we actually have an ongoing work uh, um, estimating the uh, the black oxygen levels, uh, uh, and uh, we really look forward to um, interactions with the the audience and the colleagues. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Min. Thank you so much for a great and entertaining talk. Uh, that was fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as always, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions uh, to our speaker. And if I may, maybe I can start. I have a question. Sure. The one motivated, especially by the last example with the ECG signals. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. micro signals that you're harvesting and detecting, is it is there a physical nature such that they cannot be further manipulated the, the, the same way the main signal is? Or do you think that this is sort of a never ending game and at some point you would have to go into even weaker, I'm not sure what's below micro signals. And if you would, for example, at that stage, lose the physical content, which which seems to be important. Mm -hmm. uh, so for in terms of manipulating your heart rate, and actually, uh, this is a heartbeat signal. So um, you can also potentially analyze the heart rate variability, which is uh, known in the um, neuroscience and the biomedical field that is also related to um, our, um, uh, our nerve functions uh, and actually um, is uh, 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 one of the, uh, the, the modality uh, can infer a person, whether it's uh, under stress and fatigue levels and the emotional um, uh, conditions. Uh, so those, uh, I would say that with really, really well-trained maybe spy, uh, that they may be able to really calm down their physiological conditions. Uh, it's actually much harder uh, for uh, an untrained uh, minds to manipulate those. Uh, um, so I, I see that actually, uh, that's actually where this, uh, um, there is a potential for, for example, for use by law enforcement, uh, and certainly a lie detections uh, usually uh, is uh, both the heart rate or heartbeat signal, as well as some of the sweating and other modalities. And here we only have one part, uh, but it's uh, interesting to explore uh, the use. Uh, but the flip side is uh, because I do not need your permission to actually analyze the video, there's also greater um, privacy concerns. Even in the sports uh, uh, arenas, uh, athletes uh, has been also concerned, but they also uh, have the opportunity to see if they have a, a control, if they can um, really um, determine how uh, their uh, 
physical data is used, that's actually a, a, an area they also see the opportunity to engage with fans. Those are from our discussions with uh, um, with the um, the domain users uh, that uh, um, in um, uh, potentially may be affected or benefited from this line of technology. Thank you, Mina. Thank you very much.